Uh, yeah, so my name is James Brown. I normally start with anyone come up with a original joke. I've been very impressed. I've heard them all before. I'm not going to sing any songs and I'm not going to try any, uh, anything else. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, some of the archaeology of the new forest. Um, I'm going to try and fit in kind of five years of work into 15 minutes. So there's going to be a lot of kind of over the top, but um, I will be around afterwards. So if there's any more detailed questions, I'm happy to explain more. I'm very thankful to Mike to, for explaining a bit of RTI. So I don't have to kind of drop that out of my talk. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to talk a bit about what we've done to date. Um, the, the issues we've kind of now highlighted um, with kind of working with community groups and looking at where we're going to go next kind of thing. So. Uh, just as the, the picture of the opening slide is a concrete, ar uh, illuminated concrete arrow from a World War II bombing range in the New Forest, um, and it kind of points down into the valley where there's a illuminated target, and there's some volunteers standing on the target. Um, as a starting point, the New Forest, right on the south coast, nice little marker down here, thanks to Google. Um, zooming in, uh, this is the New Forest National Park Authority. We used, to be, we used to call ourselves the newest national park. We now we've got this big neighbour here called the South Downs National Park. Um, so the one we normally introduce ourselves is we're the most densely populated national park um, and have various challenges that come with that. Um, I'm not sure if anyone saw this on the BBC News website uh, yesterday or the day before. There was some data on um, land, types of land based on really detailed analysis of satellite images. So a quick introduction to the new forest, 47% uh, natural. Compare that with uh, Glasgow City. I grabbed this last night and put it into the slide. Um, just gives you, a, it's probably not a fair kind of comparison to do, but uh, again, just using a bit of data that's available. Um, so, New Forest story, um, I will talk through this. Um, so, we're a national park. We have a duty to protect the archaeology, the ecology. We're not a, the reason we became a national park, registered as a national park, is actually due to ground nesting birds. Nothing to do with archaeology or the heritage or the medieval commoning community, but ground nesting birds. But as a result of that, we can also protect the archaeology as well. Um, lots of little buildings, lots of scheduled monuments. Um, and what we like to talk about is this idea of the time capsule. And we've actually had two, two major events that have helped protect the new forest and the archaeology within it. The first was in 1079, when William I decided to make a perfect area for one of his royal hunting parks. Um, bounded on two sides by the Solent and Southampton water. The deer weren't going to jump out onto the beach and swim across the Isle of Wight, so that kind of kept them kind of controlled. Uh, and then in 2006, we became the National Park. So as a result of that, again, we have this protection. We're not going to start building huge blocks of flats in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the park. That's on camera, so uh, okay, it's not going to happen. Um, but the other side of that, as I said, we're very densely populated uh, for a national park. Um, my, my view of the uh, a national park is more around the Northumberland, Dartmoor idea of big open skies, not bumping into anyone when you're out for a walk. Uh, you can do it in the New Forest, but you have to really think about where you're going. Um, if you are going to visit the New Forest, I suggest staying north of the A31. Not more, it's a lot nicer up there. Uh, and there's, there's kind of like about 5 million people living within a 90 minute drive. Um, and they like to come to the forest to uh, recreate um, and eventually come and feed the ponies, which we obviously discourage. Um, and then a lot of the visitors are kind of walking, cycling, enjoying the forest. And then the other kind of stat is kind of a national park, potentially stereotype. We're kind of talking white middle class, um, older kind of population. And that brings with it certain challenges as well when we talk about the community groups. Um, We've had to deal with kind of funding cuts, most everyone probably in the room has, um, when they work with various things, but we have been very lucky with our external funding, using our national park status to bring in funding from Heritage Lottery Fund, you've seen that logo a lot over the last two days. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the work we've done thanks to Heritage Lottery Funding. We've also been, um, uh, had, had money from the European Union through the uh, higher level stewardship scheme. Um, I don't think there's any mention, I haven't heard a, a Brexit clangor kind of any time yet, or a klaxon yet in the two days. I'm not gonna start going into it now, but we have been thankful to European funding and that's helped us actually uh, carry out some of the projects I'm gonna talk about as well. Um, so, and our current one is this, our past, our future, which is a landscape partnership scheme. So there's four years um, of work through Heritage Lottery funding. Uh, Heritage Lottery Fund have put about uh, three million pounds in, Match funding is bringing up to about 5.5 million pounds, uh, delivering 21 projects, two of which I'm working on, which are actually focused on the archaeology. The rest of it kind of talk about uh, hedgerows, wildlife management, uh, traditional skills, which is a bit of archaeology, so cob building. So lots of interesting things. Really encourage you to have a look at the website and see what we're doing. 
Um, but the one I'm going to talk about is LiDAR survey, we're talking lasers. Um, but this is not the kind of lasers that you see in James Bond where they're going to cut you in half, but we're talking about a laser scan of the ground to produce a really accurate 3D model. Um, the great thing about these, this laser scan is, you can see in this picture on the left hand side, is lasers come down from the plane, uh, you get the first bounce back from the top of the trees, but you also get bounce backs from underneath the trees as well. And we fly a laser scan in winter when most of the leaves are hopefully off the trees, so we can uh, produce a really accurate 3D model. Um, and we end up with this kind of hill shade chocolate, we call it a chocolate block, chocolate block screen. Um, we've been very lucky at Sofa Six Central Funding that we've actually done our own bespoke laser scan. The accuracy of this is 0.5, um, 0.5 uh, meter, uh, not 0.5, Half a meter accuracy, sorry, that's even way easier way to say it. Half a meter accuracy um, and produces this kind of model of the forest um, where we can actually run it for a computer program and strip all the trees out. Let's say it's a national park and we're going to clear fell all the trees to find the archaeology. Um, it also means that we can start identifying, really kind of targeting some of our survey work um, rather than hopefully tripping over it or falling into it, which is how some of it's been done in the past. Um, so, what? Um, let's actually have a look at this in detail. So traditional aerial photograph, uh, you can see a few trees, some nice bits of heathland, uh, nothing really jumps out. Putting that through the LiDAR, uh, you get this nice banjo enclosure or a snail enclosure depending on, on what you want to call it and um, who you're talking to. Um, and other examples, uh, so this is a site called Matley and we have some very nice uh, barrows, Bronze Age barrows down here. Um, and this is believed to be an Iron Age hill fort. However, with this circular structure, we think it's potentially slightly earlier than that. Um, we are actually in the next couple of weeks going to be doing some geophysical, geophysical survey inside this um, site here. And also where there is kind of footpaths eroded through, we're going to potentially look at the, clearing up those sections and trying to find a bit more detail as well. Um, and basically what we do is we digitize from the LiDAR but we don't use the LiDAR in isolation. We use it alongside aerial photography and historic maps to produce a real good data pack before we go out on surveys. Um, we have made the LiDAR available online and we get a lot of people emailing and saying, oh, look, I found something with the LiDAR. We turn on the aerial photographs and realize it's a cattle feeder or um, some sheep is a bit of an example as well. Um, another example, this is some World War, uh, First World War training trenches. This, actually, this site is actually in the middle of the heathland, so potentially you think it might be picked up by your photography, um, but it didn't, it, it's very faint in heather, um, and even actually now going out to site, it's quite difficult to find it on the ground unless you really know where you're going. Um, but this was a site that was used for training um, dogs to go out to the First World War trenches, so they were running dogs back and forth on these trenches while setting explosions off either side. Um, and we've actually now found some photos from that training to go with that, so we can really start illustrating that to the general public. Um, and the reason I'm talking about uh, a bit of the LiDAR stuff is, though we had ours done bespoke in 2010, 2010-2011, um, uh, big data, open data, basic LiDAR is now being made available for free to everyone. Uh, in England we get that for the Environment Agency, if you're up here in Scotland, uh, I found this is the site you go and get your LiDAR data from. Um, Scottish Remote Sensing Portal website's on the bottom. Really easy system to go into um, and then you can retrieve LiDAR. The, the issue is you can only retrieve LiDAR that actually exists. So you can see there it's not a complete coverage of Scotland but it was, it's only, it's only going to get better because this technology is getting easier to run and now actually we've got drones are doing this as well as planes so you can get kind of quite detailed LiDAR survey details and traditionally this LiDAR is about a metre accuracy so it's still really good and can be uh, really revealing. So I would encourage you to take an opportunity to get online and have a look and see what you can find on there. So we have been using the LiDAR to put, and the aerial photographs have been digitized, put these data packs together and then going out with volunteers into the field so they can actually target their survey. Um, they're using tablets to be able to navigate to the site and then complete survey forms, take photographs and update our record for that site, tell us whether it is actually archaeology or it's not. We found a few areas where we thought we had, we had from the aerial photographs, we had uh, World War II uh, bombing decoys. Uh, it looks like something on the LiDAR go out and actually it's children's dens where they piled up things on the side of trees. So it's verification but also then adding to what it actually looks like on the ground. So um, the, the tablets we're using, we're actually using ArcGIS online which you have to pay for. However, we also use, you can actually export the digitized material from the LiDAR to Google Earth. 
which is free software, so you can navigate out to your site using the, the lines on Google Earth. And there's also a, um, we've been, we used a field trip GB collector form, which was again another free piece of software. So you have to fill in those questionnaires. Um, so again, that, there's a lot of free material here that groups can actually use. Um, and then, oh, five minutes away, okay, Ooh, I've got um, Basically, so what have we done? We've done quite, we, we think we've done quite well. Um, large, large number of volunteer days, 2016. Uh, thousands of archaeological sites added to the historic environment record. We're not claiming we've discovered them all um, because they've potentially been rediscovered, but they're actually being added into the public database. So it means they are actually then becoming uh, available to everyone to, to kind of then work on, interpret, and kind of, um, kind of add more information to. Um, we've also been capturing oral histories. Uh, we've also been crowdsourcing translations where we've actually had some German prison war camps and we've been using Micropass to translate some of the newsletters from them. Um, they say the average age of our participants is, is over 50. Um, and we've kind of engaged volunteers and also we've saved a lot of money, but we've also kind of done a lot more than I could do in just a couple, you know, what I've done in what we've managed to do in two years would have taken potentially 10 years. And I would love to be employed for 10 years walking around the forest, but we can't all that, we can't, we can't have that. Um, so I think we've done really well on engaging volunteers and individuals from local groups. So we are still at that a challenge of how do we actually really engage the local community groups um, it talks about the in the forest and being of a, a certain age. Um, they enjoy going to their monthly talk, um, but are kind of and sort unfortunately declining in size. So we want to kind of look at how do we get young young blood into those groups and get them engaged back with the heritage that they were quite passionate about. But they've kind of got into I want not to say a bit of a rut, but potentially just kind of enjoying being told about stuff rather than actually going to the research themselves. Um, I'm not sure if anyone saw this, I'm not going to go into detail now, um, but there was a piece of work done by Historic England about the, um, the value of community generated research and actually how very, only about 40% of that was actually making it into historic environment records. So this is done in, in England, but I imagine it's very similar to uh, across the border up here, that there's a lot of work, there's a huge amount of work going on, but is that going into the, the official records? Or, and if it's not, where is it going? You know, local publication's great, but actually that needs to be captured as well. So um, one of the things we're working, we're really focusing on the history groups now, we're kind of hosting community heritage forums where we try and bring them all together to talk and network, talk about what they are, what they kind of want to do, how they can share ideas, but also using our heritage lottery fund money to prevent, provide training. So we're, when I get back next week, we're running some GIS training. So again, using quantum GIS, which is a free software, for them to be able to start digitizing from aerial photographs and maps using the Google Earth then going on. So they can actually start doing some of their own surveys um, and preaching the converted here. But we also, uh, two weeks ago, hosted our, our first community heritage uh, conference where we actually had uh, speakers from local groups talking alongside professionals. Um, so basically what's been happening here in the last two days, but in the, in the new forest, that was quite a new idea. Um, and they, didn't, they weren't confident to speak, they were doing poster displays as well. Um, two minutes, right? Uh, very positive feedback. Um, you have to believe me. Um, or you can read that very quickly. Uh, and two, <laughs> uh, two other things uh, to, to just talk very quickly about um, is a project that we've been working with Bournemouth University. I've said this to be a few people over the last few days. Universities really worth just contacting them with cheeky questions because they uh, they have they have student projects they need to fulfil and also they have these tick boxes now with kind of um, the amount of kind of funds going in for kind of um, tuition fees and stuff like that. They have these boxes where they want to try and engage the local community and always kind of pitch themselves into that local area. So Bournemouth University on our doorstep, um, they have basically given us all their old um, geophysical equipment, all in fine working order, but they use more newer technology for their students and they've trained our local history groups how to use that equipment. Um, so this is uh, Paul Cheatham from Bournemouth University teaching some of the groups on how to use the uh, geophysical equipment. Um, and here we've got a classic uh, from a local history group with a pipe member here using a bit of the uh, geophysical ge 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 survey. Um, so this is great. So local groups can use the equipment, go out and start producing some amazing results as well. Um, and again, this is not being us pushing this onto them. They are, we help them, we lead them to the training. They do the training, they go and find their own sites. And also then they get a lot, they, they can find, they find it a lot easier to get permission to survey a land than potentially we do as actually a national park because we're also a planning authority, so farmers don't like us. Um, and then luckily this is a bit where I'm very thankful to Mike because he's already talked about RTI, so that's 
save me some time because uh, I'm pretty much going to finish now. Um, local graveyard survey, um, traditional pen and paper forms. We've always been using tablets for online kind of survey. And we've taught the groups how to use RTI photography. As Mike said, the great thing about this is that the equipment is really, it's not like laser scanning. The equipment's really easy to get hold of. As long as you've got a camera that doesn't autofocus, you can use your mobile phone or cameras, which most of the volunteers have. Um, and your results are headstones. You can start revealing um, the actual writing on the headstones. Sorry, it's really quick, um, but you can see that the two differences there. Um, and just a final thing, sorry, final thing to say um, is that we've now also um, just launched our New Forest Knowledge Gateway website. Um, to be honest, it's probably not going to be much interest for most people up here, but this is where we've actually made all the data I'm talking about available in one place. First, I talked about people being able to see the LIDAR and reporting cows or cattle feeders. We've now given the, the ability to um, basically turn on and off the LiDAR with the historic aerial photographs with the historic, aerial, uh, with the historic maps that we're getting from API from the National Library of Scotland, historic maps collection, a uh, great resource that we send most of our volunteers to, um, and as well as showing the local archives in New Forest, this is also pulling data from the National Archives, British Library, using New Forest terms. So it means that a lot of the data is in one place that they can then research and listen to these, here's some of the sources we're using and the only one we want to say on here is we've also then created the ability for groups to have their own pages so they can promote their group where their meeting points are um, on the side here you can see the, the various articles they've uploaded because again it's talking about community contribution um, so yeah uh, I won't talk about that that's a fair, basically, uh, final word, one of my, uh, <laughs> uh, we were, one of my colleagues has had a, a PhD grant to, a uh, PhD to look at the use of mobile phone data, anonymised mobile phone data, which is going to be really interesting because a lot of people are carrying those mobile phones around their pocket, which tells the network provider where you are, and also then with Twitter and Instagram, there might, might be a few blank faces there, um, the younger generations are using those all the time. So actually how do we start using those to really start engaging some of the younger generation that we are, we've tried with the geophysics and the, the laser scanning, the drone, but actually we can almost use what's in their pocket um, to kind of really kind of get, um, get engagement with them. But uh, that might be something for next year or the year after you invite him, invite Lawrence Shaw back to, uh, to talk about um, some of the results of that work. So I think that's going to be really powerful. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry for uh, taking all your time, hopefully uh, everyone's still awake. Um, and my contact details, as I'm staying around afterwards, so if there's any specific questions, then do, uh, do ask. Thank you.